Hello, everybody. Welcome to Fruitful Trees. And I'm standing in front of my Super Haas avocado tree. And I cut it back last year, and it's growing really nice. It's starting to flower. I have a Monroe avocado grafted onto it. I'm just learning a lot about avocados, and I just love the fruit. I love the trees and everything about them. But uh, just like everything, there are some things that can mess up our paradise, whether it's hurricanes or or funguses or bugs or things like this. Uh, the avocado is becoming a victim uh, to uh, a new uh, fungus or a laurel wilt disease, as it's called. And uh, I'm not really concerned about it because I don't have an avocado grove with my avocado trees right next to each other in every area where they're going to spread and create a major issue. Uh, but it's still uh, not a good thing uh, from what, what uh, is going on. There's many, many acres of avocados being lost today. Well, like me, many people love avocados and, and just all different varieties and learning about all different varieties. So I want to get as much information to you as possible about these different uh, growing situations and diseases and also what varieties taste the best and so on. I continue to look and research for people that have uh, knowledge, long-term knowledge with avocados and just try to get the best information as possible. And one of the places I found in, is the University of Florida's place called Trek, which is in Homestead, Florida, South Florida, which is doing more research on avocados than probably anywhere else in the world. And uh, they're doing a lot of extensive research about the, the low world disease and uh, Jonathan Crane, he's a doctor, or, uh, or he has a doctorate in uh, plant uh, plant biology and so on, and he has just so much great information, and he's a very busy person. I was glad to get on the show, uh, get him on the show and interview him and, and ask him all about these questions about avocados, and that's what it is today. We speak a lot about the laurel wilt, but we also speak about questions about avocado par productivity and in determining how close you should plant them or how often you should trim them, and also uh, some remedies for the disease uh, that they're looking into and investigating. And he took us uh, right to the grove there to show us exactly what it looks like to have the disease and all that in today's interview. Now, if you have an avocado tree uh, or, or have experienced this laurel wilt disease or some other things you wanna share, please post them below the video in the comments because it only helps uh, each other learn more uh, about avocados and all other fruits uh, and learn more and also what's your favorite variety of avocado and where are you located and talk about the different growing season but here is Jonathan Crane at Trek in Homestead talking about avocados all right so we're heading over to the avocados here and uh, how many varieties of avocados would you say you have here we have about 75 varieties of avocados in, our, in our collection. Okay. And, and I'd say probably 35 of them were donated to us by Noris Ledesma from Fairchild Farm a few years ago. I know she's not with the farm anymore, but she had donated to them. And that added to the, about the 40 that we had already. Great. Is that Laura Will? Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. so this is this is a tree. This, this planting was originally uh, planted about 75 years ago. So you can see by the size of the trunks of these trees, they were big, 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 old, old trees. And it was an absolutely gorgeous planting. Most of the trees looked like that over there. <laughs> these are the ones that have survived. And this is, uh, we have stumped them several times. In other words, cut them back down to four or five feet, and then they regrow. Uh, and that's called the rejuvenation process so that we can uh, better take care of the tree if it's not too tall and too big. Um, but anyway, you can see how dark green those are, beautiful. Two varieties, Lula and Boot, uh, Boot 7, uh, old time varieties. Um, Lula is a very high quality variety. And uh, Laurel Wilt came into this planting. And as you've seen with the camera, as you scroll around, missing trees, a lot of open space. This used to be a solid planting, uh, I'd say five years ago. And um, unfortunately, um, an ambrosia beetle or beetles came in, transmitted the disease to some trees, and it started to kill the trees. 
And what you're seeing here is that the disease, once it gets into a tree, it can move through the root system from tree to tree. So eventually, fruit trees, if they're, especially if they're of the same species, their roots will graft together. And so what you're really seeing when you look at an orchard or a grove, if they're old, mature trees and, and particular species such as avocados, they will root graft together and you're looking at one organism, which is sort of cool to think that you can have this you know, two acre planting and it's actually one big organism. Um, and so what happens is the disease gets into this one tree and it stops transpiring water. It stops moving water through its leaves. And what happens then is the tree that's next to it that ha still has leaves pulls that water to itself, but it's also pulling this, the inoculum or the spores from the pathogen, the fungus, to the tree. And this is what you see happening. And so the adjacent tree, and so then you end up with trees marching down the row being killed. Um, and if you don't remove a tree that's affected, um, generally within, for, for every month, somewhere between four and six new trees come down with the disease. So they, they travel that fast. It travels really, really fast. From the time a tree gets infected to the time it dies, usually, is somewhere between four and eight weeks. Wow. It now, can, is it, uh, if there was trees in this person, a different variety, let's say that was a, a mango tree and then an avocado, right. can it skip it or not necessarily? Well, if, it, like in this grove, because of how old these trees are, there's roots standing right underneath us. And so we know that this moved from one road to the next, just through this root grafting. So it could bypass the mango tree and get to the avocado. The chances would be less, of course, because you've got this intermediate tree. Uh, but yes, it, it can happen. So if somebody had a smaller yard, it'd be better to not plant two avocados next to each other if you have the opportunity? Uh, it, yes. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Uh, you know, they probably won't root graft to each other for 20, 25, maybe even 30 years. But if you're going to be there 30 or 40 years, you might think about it. Um, hopefully by then we will have you know, some better solutions. issue for the avocado industry in Florida. I mean, we've lost probably over 2,000 acres, over 200,000 trees to laurel wilt. Um, currently, the treatments that we know or that have recommended um, are not really satisfactory um, because it includes removing affected trees, scouting constantly, uh, removing the trees, destroying the tree because the ambrosia beetles that also move the disease. So this disease moves by root to root, but it also moves by ambrosia beetles. And ambrosia beetles are very, very small, like one, two, three millimeters long. Um, and they bore into the tree, and they form galleries, and they lay their eggs there, but they also inoculate the tree with a symbiont or a fungus that then grows and flowers, you can call them flowering fruits, and they feed on the fungus. They're not feeding on the wood. They're feeding on the fungus. So they're fungus farmers. And what happens is they then develop new young, and there's usually several generations in a colony, you could call it a colony, a uh, gallery, and uh, then when they mature, and it only takes about a month, month and a half, then they can come out and they fly off and they look for a new tree to infest. Um, so, and that's long distance transport, that can be miles, whereas the route to route is right next to So how have these trees survived over there, or are they just making their way there? Well, so we are not, you know, we don't know how Ambrosia beetles are very weak flyers, but, so if, if an ambrosia beetle is, was in an avocado grove, let's say in a neighbor, uh, and it got caught by the wind, it might just get pushed here. Um, you know what I mean? And so we don't know how it started here. We just, I just remember seeing the first tree. Uh, we tried to stop it by removing the tree very quickly, very rapidly. Unfortunately, it got into the root system and, and just started moving, and this is what you're seeing happen here now, um, where the trees end up looking like that one over there. Um, that's a prime example. So that tree there that's completely brown, and all its neighbors that I've, have been dead for a while, um, that's what ends up happening. Are you leaving in there only because your research that you're yes. doing? Yes. We, we decided what we would do because we couldn't save this 
grove. We decided to inoculate some trees on purpose to see the movement and to document and watch the movement. And that's what we've been doing. So we're getting ready. We've already, all the empty spaces, we've already removed those trees. And so as we go, I've already asked them to come in and remove these trees that are affected. And so we'll try to hold on to as many of them as possible, um, but eventually we'll probably take everything out and replant it uh, because, you know, there's nothing we can do. Um, you know, the, the, the recommendations are to scout, to look for trees showing symptoms such as the brown leaves, uh, the wilting, and remove it immediately. And then you have to re destroy the wood as well because the beetles propagate inside the trees. And if you leave the tree, then it can propagate inside the tree. So it takes a lot of money, a lot of manpower um, to do that. And so uh, people are doing that, but not as quickly as it would, not as quickly, let's say, to prevent it from moving from sure. its neighbor to neighbor. Is that the only fruit that you know it affects? It's only affecting trees in the laurel family or the Laurasee. Yeah, and so it's affecting these commercial avocados and then other trees in the Laurasee, Swamp Bay, Red Bay, things like that. These are native trees. But from a fruit standpoint, avocado. From a fruit avocado. standpoint, it's, it's, these, it's avocado. From a commercial standpoint. These other, Red Bay and Swamp Bay, they also produce fruit, but they're you know minute fruit that, that uh, wildlife uh, lives on, right? Sure. Um, so yes, this is the only one. Um, the only place in the U.S. where laurel wilt is affecting an avocado industry is Florida. Um, however, the pathogen and the ambrosia beetles are moving. They're, they're already from North Carolina all the way to the tip of Florida. They're now all the way west to the east coast of Texas. Wow. So we are very concerned about our friends in, in California, in Mexico, Central and South America because it's possible that this could just keep moving through the natural areas on these native trees in the laurel family and eventually reach their production areas. Now, these are commercial grows. What about the average backyard grower that has a maybe one, one avocado tree and a whole bunch of other trees? Are they less susceptible because they don't, they don't interact? I would, I would say they're probably less susceptible. Why? I, why? Because it's not like a monoculture where you have a massive amount. The, the beetles... Um, some of these beetles are not selective on what kind of trees that they attack. Um, but if they, they will, uh, and then some of them are attracted to avocado. So I would say there's less of a chance. But I can tell you, I've been riding through the landscapes of South Florida for quite a while. I see trees, avocado trees dying in, in neighborhoods. Once it starts to get into a neighborhood, it tends to wipe out quite a few of the avocado trees in that neighborhood. The other thing I would tell you though, one of the, one of the strategies besides removing trees, besides injecting trees with a fungicide, which very, very only about 20% of the, the commercial groves inject a fungicide to keep the disease away. Um, it, and besides removing trees, the other big thing that's happening is people are replanting their avocado trees. And that might sound crazy, but it's actually not. Number one is these young avocado trees are not going to be root grafted to their neighbors for years. Second thing is the beetles are in general attracted to large diameter wood and large diameter trees. So they're not gonna be as likely to attack these young trees. Even if one of them did get attacked, it's not going to move from its root system to a neighboring root system. So the industry is basically replanting itself at a rapid rate. I'm talking about tens of thousands of trees. And this is smart because you want to keep your production up, keep the packing house up, keep the businesses going, um, and so that we have Florida avocados. I mean, it's, it just makes a lot of business sense to do that. And sure. that's what we see happening. Now, once a tree has something like that, then you start seeing it. Can any way it could be rescued or come back or...? No, what, you know, we would, we have tried and the commercial growers have tried. So one of the strategies was you start to see the tree wilt and I mean like green leaves wilting, not brown leaves. And you come in and you cut that limb off. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. And we haven't been able to tell, you know, how, why did it work this time? We do know from the plant pathologists um, that this disease moves very, very rapidly inside avocado trees and the other Loraceae. And, and that's sort of unusual. You'll be attacked, let's say I'm attacked on my thigh, I um, and if I'm a tree, I'm trying to wall off that infection. And so I'm trying to wall it off with tyloses and with gums and resins 
before I can completely wall it off, it's spores moving. move to here. Now I've got another infection, and then it moves to here. Sure. So it, it and I and I'm saying, you know, in days, it's it's distributing itself throughout the tree, and that's sort of unusual in how quickly it. it I was at a farm yesterday, and they had uh, trees that looked like that, but then the, the owner said it started growing back green again. Could yeah. that have been something else? Okay, so that's that's no so. So what happens is, you know, you have this large trunk which has a lot of carbohydrate and a lot of energy and the tree wants to survive and wants to regrow. So sometimes like in this tree, for instance, the pathogen is o only over there for right now. So it has not moved sufficiently to affect the wood over here. Eventually it will. And what we sometimes see most of the time comes out, grows, the tree looks like it's recovering. You know, this tree looks like it's recovering. Well, here's a good example. This tree looked like it was, looked like it was recovering, and now you see this. So this is the second time this tree has flushed out with new growth. Flushed out after we cut it back, and now it's flushing out again in, it, in an attempt to recover. Occasionally, they seem to recover, but like I said, most of the time, they're, they're not recovering well. And how do you get rid of, so when you say get rid of the wood, you go down to the root system and get rid of yeah, it? Yeah, so there's different ways. Uh, early on, people would push the trees with a backhoe or a front-end loader and then burn the trunks, you know, burn, burn the wood and the trunks. Then we went to chippers, and now we have these um, shredders, which are front-end loader, front loader uh, shredders. They're a big piece of equipment, very strong. And what happens is you push the tree over, and then the shredder comes in and just grinds it up basically in about 10 minutes. Do you have to get all the roots out? Not well? all the roots. Um, it's, it's the major roots uh, that come out when you push the tree. Okay. The disease, can't, the disease can survive in a root system. But let's say I, I push this tree and I want it to replant. I can replant right away. It's not going to move from that old root system into your new tree root system. Why? And, and it, why? Because it takes a very long time for it to root graft. They're not going to root graft. It's going to be years and years and years. So you don't have to worry about, oh, I had Laurel Wilt in this plot here. I can't plant. No, you can plant. Um, you know, you want to make sure you get as much of the root system out, of course, and the trunk. Um, you know, because when you, when you have organic matter like wood decaying, it can produce some substances that aren't healthy for young trees to get established. But that's not moral. So when you say it can move from this tree to that tree quite quickly, yes. but if you put another tree here, yeah. it won't move there quickly. Well, it's not, no, it's not, no, that's not what I mean. Yeah, so it won't move into this, the new tree quickly. Right? It's not going to move into the new tree. Why? Because it's not established roots? Well, because they're not root grafted to the diseased neighbor. So if I take this tree out and I plant another avocado tree, it's not going to root graft to this sick tree or to that sick tree. You know, you're looking at 15, who knows, you know, many, many years. And so you don't have to worry that it's going to become... And the farther apart the trees are, the less chance, the uh, longer amount of time before they root graft. Um, well, that makes sense. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes, okay. yes, because, you know, the roots only go out so far each year. Um, but when you're 75 years old as a tree, sure. your root system is everywhere. And, and you can prove this, um, this concept about the root grafting in that um, if I took this one tree and I went to that middle tree and I cut it down to the ground and I painted it with a herbicide, the trees on either side are also going to die. Because of the root graft. What if I took a tree like that size, cut it down, and moved it to a spot like this? Will it just be still considered a new tree? Yes. Yeah, it's not going to root okay. to this thing for a long time. Okay. Yeah, so not? of the varieties you have here, let me switch uh, gears here and sure. ask you this question. Sure. Uh, how far are they planted and how how far are they planted? Yeah. This, this grove originally was 25 feet by 25 feet between trees, which is sort of a traditional planting. Uh, back in the 70s, um, they decided that it was that they were going to do some other types of experiments, so they removed every other row. So this is actually 25 by 50 feet, and it's been that way probably for 45 years now. Typically in the industry, uh, people planted well anywhere from uh, 15 feet to 25 feet between a row, and anywhere from between 15 and 30 feet between rows. Probably. Uh, 
high density plantings. We don't recommend those um, unless you're willing to remove trees once they start crowding each other uh, because they become too hard to manage. So how, how, how on high density for backyard growers, what's the closest oh, you can get away okay. with? So dooryard, okay. Dooryard's a little bit different situation. I recommend people, uh, it depends on the person. If you're gonna manage the height and you're gonna prune your trees, you can plant them a little bit closer to adjacent trees and also closer to structures, but not under, not near telephone wires or sure. anything. But you can plant them. So as an example, um, if you're gonna plant an avocado tree and you're not gonna prune it, you're not gonna do anything like that, it needs to be 25 plus feet away from any structure, including your home, any wires, um, other trees and things like that. You don't want it falling into your house, into the telephone wires, um, shading adjacent fruit trees so you don't get any fruit production. So it's gotta be you know, 25 feet plus. If you're gonna prune it, I mean at least once a year and keep the height down uh, and, and keep it within bounds, you could probably plant it 20 feet apart and you'd be okay. So I just planted a bunch of trees 10 feet apart. Is that too close? <laughs> if, oh. Yeah, I would say that's too close. Okay. You know, if, if and I'll just back up and say, you know, if, if, if you have what would be called either dwarfing or non-vigorous trees, so for instance, some, some mango varieties, you know, cogshaw, some of these others, yeah, sure. they tend to be less vigorous, right? So you can plant them 15 feet apart as long as you're going to keep pruning. Um, but there's no real, we don't have any dwarfing rootstocks in our guys. And so, you know, if you, if you plant them too close, you're eventually going to end up... What about the new one that they call the little, little cottle or whatever? It's... Yeah, okay. But, the but, warts, the warts, it's the warts. Oh, the warts. It's uh, being promoted now as the little cottle and the people saying they can grow it in containers and keep it small. Yeah, maybe. I, I, I'm not so sure about that. Okay. Yeah. So, okay, so... Uh, now, I know I, Alex said on mango trees, you can keep the dwarf ones pretty small, but the bigger ones, if you try to keep them small, it'll affect production. Yes. What about avocados if you try to keep them small? Yeah. Will it as well? Same thing. Yeah. If you, keep, if, if you have to keep pruning so heavily to keep it in bounds, it's just going to grow leaves and shoots and, and production is going to go down. And that's another reason why you don't want them so close. Yeah, What's the sure. recommended size you would suggest? Height, yeah, so the recommended height, um, I would tell you that it depends on your distance between the rows. So if, if your rows are 25 feet apart, your tree shouldn't be much more than about 16 or 17 feet high. Um, and if your rows are closer, 20 feet, then it should be you know, 12 feet, something like that. And basically just cutting off that top. But if you keep them at 12 feet, eventually it might mess up production? Well, okay, that, um, that's what I was going to, yeah. Okay. Very good point. So, in general, I don't worry about what's being produced at the top of the tree. So let me put it this way. Most of the commercial equipment, harvesting equipment, spray equipment, if the trees are much above 16 feet, certainly 20 feet, you can't spray it. It's not easy to harvest. It's inefficient to harvest. It sometimes ends up shading the bottom of the tree. You're losing the production down here. So, um, so you want to. So I don't worry about what's up on top. I want my production like on this. I want the production from the top of the tree to the bottom of that tree. And like I said, if you let this tree get too big and too crowded, you're going to lose. And I'm sure you've seen this. You're going to lose all this production. Sure. I'm sure you've seen in dooryards sure. especially. Sure. The first fruits is like 10 feet. Sure. Well, if you had kept the tree religiously low, uh, you know, somewhere between 12 feet. I, I have avocado tree at home. I keep it at 12 feet. I, and I don't worry about the production on the top. What I want is all this production that's on the sides. Um, and I'll still get a little bit of production. Can you keep it at 8 feet? Does it matter with no, that? No, 8 feet might be a little hard because it sort of depends on the size of the wood you have to cut every year. I so agree. I might cut the trees. So for instance, um, I, I will cut our, our avocados and mangoes. Usually I'll cut them somewhere between 13 and 15 feet. So one year I'll hit them at 13, next year I'll hit them at 15, and I'll go back to 14. So I, I keep fluctuating it. Um, and that's why I'm not hitting the same joints, the same places. Uh, but I don't worry about the production. I'm just on the very top of the tree. 
So, uh, but you're not just talking about the production about the size of the tree, but also when it's smaller and you cut out the big wood, it might yes. affect production on a whole tree overall. Yeah, so if you have uh, the other, okay, so one more reason, I'm sorry, one more reason why you want to keep the trees somewhere below 20 feet, hurricanes. Yeah, well, I know below, I'm so good. If you can get too low, will it mess up yes, production? Yes, it will. will. It so can. what about like, I don't know, Richard Campbell has all this mango groves with all these close trees. Right. Nine by nine apart. Yeah. Do you think that's just short term, long term? It'd be hard to do that if he's using normal well, varieties. Yeah, he's using a system where he's doing tree he's doing limb replacement. So he's letting some limbs fruit, flower, and fruit for a number of years. Then he goes in, removes that, and another limb replaces it. So that can be sustained much longer than if I just come in on top and hedging. You know, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Sure. The, fruit, the machinery that just comes sure. in, sure, cuts it right. Um, that's you know a more crude method, a faster method. But if you're doing the hand pruning and the selective pruning, yes, you should be able to maintain the production for a lot longer. I don't know how long. Same thing on avocados. Same thing with avocados. Um, the other thing that plays into the pruning is your location. So a tree, if I if I have three avocado trees or mango trees, all the same size, planted at the same time, right? And I plant one. I'm in Israel one I'm in California, and one I'm in Florida. Come back in a year, the one in Israel, I had planted it this high, it, it's about this high. Sure. The one in California, I had planted at that height, it's now about here. The one in Florida, I planted at this height, it's now this big. And so temperatures really affect how quickly and how hard it is to maintain a tree's size. Because we have warm temperatures much longer period of time than either of those two places. So I don't recommend, you know, if I'm if I'm in California or somewhere else and somebody's asking me about pruning, I said you gotta take into consideration your climate. What I would do in Florida is not necessarily what I'm gonna do in California, Israel, or, or, or Mexico. But you're saying like in a dooryard garden, yeah. that people can get away with mangoes doing what Richard's doing. If they're dedicated to do it. And sure. now if they're willing to do that yeah. with avocados, are they, can they get away with it? Yeah, or but it I don't think you're going to have an avocado tree. I mean, there are some, some high-density avocado or groves uh, throughout the world. Um, some of that I'm familiar with, they're growing reed avocado, which is a Guatemalan type. But the pruning practice that they're using is what Richard's using. But they are also using a plant growth regulator that inhibits plant growth. So they are pruning limbs and then they're painting the area around those limbs with, some, with a, a substance that inhibits new shoots from sprouting out. So that's an added tool. Most homeowners are, are not sure. going to use this plant growth regulator to control this pruning. It's a very sophisticated system. They keep the trees literally seven feet by about seven or eight feet wide in a, in a cylinder-like shape. Very productive, very interesting, high, high labor maintenance because it's all hand pruned. Uh, and if you have the labor, and certainly if you have a small operation and you're doing it yourself, that's fine. It works great. But when you're talking about 30, 40, 100 acres, sure. hectares, now you're, you know, labor is maybe cheap in some places, but it may not be that cheap. Uh, okay. So, last question about the avocados is what's your favorite variety? Oh, boy. Um, it's one that's not as, not, well, there's several. One that's not super productive, Dupuis yeah. is one, uh, but Choquette, I also like Choquette very much. Um, Monroe is good. There's a number, and there's some West Indian, Simmons can be good. Um, you know, one of the big advantages of dooryard avocado is that, let's say you're growing Simmons, and they normally commercially come in in June, right? The nice thing about the dooryard tree, you don't have to pick all your fruit in June. You can leave the fruit on the tree and you're picking June, July, August, maybe even into September. And the longer you leave that fruit on the tree, two things. One is it gets bigger. And the other thing is it accumulates more oil. So it becomes more nutty in flavor. So that's a big advantage for dooryard people. You don't have to pick them like the commercial people. Sure. All right. Well, thank you. Sure. All right, everybody. Thank you, Jonathan, for coming on the show. And I really uh, pray that you uh, appreciated that as much as I did, because he has just so much knowledge about uh, my passion, fruit trees, and uh, one of my favorites, avocados. And we all love avocados. Uh, you don't realize how much money we spend on avocados until uh, 
you know, somewhere like Mexico says, oh, we're going to not send avocados to the United States because whatever reason, the United States isn't going to import them. And then all those reports come out to see how much money we'll actually lose. People eat avocados, whether it's in a form of guacamole for the Super Bowl or if it's in form of like me, just as my uh, daily nutrition. Uh, people love avocados and uh, there's a reason. And most people haven't even tasted some of the amazing varieties out there. I like what Jonathan said on the video about his favorite varieties because I have all of those and I haven't tasted uh, all of them, but I have all of them. Uh, but so I'm looking forward to tasting them. And I got uh, 20 varieties myself and I know somebody locally who has 40 varieties. And then I got to go down there and see uh, Jonathan. He had a bunch of varieties. And then I go to an avocado farm uh, all the time and I'm going to be going there again and, and doing a video with that. I'll put the link below here. If you want to taste some of these avocados that you haven't tasted, uh, there are places uh, specifically in Homestead, Florida, where is like the avocado capital of the world, <laughs> growing avocados and, and and shipping them throughout the country. And one of my friends, Tom, at uh, Sleepy Lizard Avocado Farm, uh, he actually has uh, three amazing varieties of avocado uh, that he plants commercially, and he ships boxes of that uh, to people all over the country. I highly recommend you check out these other avocados, how great they taste. And these avocados are big, so it's not like the little small ones you can eat in one sitting. I'll put his link below the video as well. Great guy, great videos, great knowledge as well. And yeah, so that was today's video. Put your comments and questions below. Thank you so much. Have a great day and keep growing.